After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has been raised from the dead. And indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. He is risen. 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 He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. He is risen. 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 He is risen indeed.
God of life, thank you for this day of celebration. This day when we remember and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, who was born, lived, died, and was raised for our sake. This is a very different Easter day than we are used to, God. All the things we usually do on this special holy day are not possible for us today. Not because we do not love and care, but because we do love and care. We love you and we love one another enough to sacrifice our typical celebrations for the well-being of others. On this Easter day, God, we need you more than ever. We need your new life to be poured into us as we deal with the stress and anxiety of not knowing what the future holds. We need your healing from a disease whose effects are so incredibly devastating in so many ways. We need your forgiveness for the ways we have neglected the well-being of others by carelessness and thoughtless actions. We need your saving grace as we adapt to circumstances beyond our control, circumstances we were not prepared for. We need your guidance as we seek to learn how to live in this new normal, and as we look for ways to serve you by serving others in this strange time. You are the God of life, and you bring resurrection out of death as we grieve the loss of loved ones, the loss of normal activities, the loss of jobs, the loss of face-to-face -face connection and the loss of so many other things, may we not lose our hope and faith. Focus our attention on you, God, and on the gift of resurrection you are already offering during this time. Help us to see the seeds of new life that you are already planting. Give us glimpses of the new things you are doing and grow within us hope 
for a new and better future. May the lessons we learn in this crisis make us better people, people who love more, give more, share more, people who aren't afraid to be vulnerable, people who truly believe the things we have learned about your love and goodness. Today, God, we celebrate that the tomb is empty and that our Savior is alive and walks with us during our time of crisis. We celebrate that he knows what we are going through and that he will give us strength and courage for our journey. We celebrate that you loved us so much that you gave him to us so that we might know you more fully and so we might experience the power of your love, not only in your willingness to die for us, but in your willingness and ability to give us resurrected life here and now and in the life to come. It is in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. And now let us join our voices together as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Kingdom come, a will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, Find us the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And I'm going to invite everybody up for the children's message. And today is a very special day. Um, it is Easter Sunday. And so today we are going to have a story about Jesus and about Holy Week and what we've been doing all week uh, with Jesus last week. So what happens on Easter Sunday? Can you all tell um, me? Uh, Thomas? When Jesus rises. That's right. What happens um, that, who comes, who comes on Easter morning? The Easter bunny. Angel. Easter bunny. Easter bunny. That's right. The Easter bunny drops something off to help me tell you all the story of Easter and Jesus. Can you all tell me what he dropped me off? Eggs. Some eggs. The eggs like us. Eggs to talk about Jesus today. So I'm going to read y'all's story and then the eggs go along with the story. Does that sound good to everybody? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Eggs. Okay, here we go. Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the children's room and immediately find a donkey tied and a colt. Untie them and bring me one. If anyone says anything to you, say the Lord needs them and he will care for them at once. The people of Jerusalem showed their happiness by spreading tree branches and coats on the road. This was their way of honoring Jesus, much like we use a red carpet today. But now we can open the blue egg. Mm -hmm. Amelia's going to be my helper today. Can you open the blue egg for us? What's in the blue egg? Can everyone see what this is? No. Donkey. A donkey. Jesus rode a donkey into the city of Jerusalem. So as we get into Easter Sunday, the next egg we have is the light orange egg. After Jesus had been whipped, the soldiers took branches with thorns, twisted them into the shape of a crown, and put it on Jesus' head. Again, Jesus bled. We know that because Jesus was the Son of God, he could have stopped the men from hurting him. But he let them continue. Do you all know why? Because even though he hadn't done anything wrong, he had not sinned, Jesus was taking the punishment for all the things that any person had ever done or will ever do, and that includes all of us. So as we open the orange egg, can y'all see this? It's a crown. Now let's find out what could be in the green egg we have here. The soldiers took Jesus to the top of a hill outside the city. Then using nails much larger than these, they nailed him to a rough wooden cross and he died a few hours later. 
Because God loves people so much, he was willing to let Jesus be punished for our sins, the things we do or the ways we act that don't please God. And even though it hurt Jesus badly, he was willing to do what God the Father asked because Jesus loves us too. Now we open up the green egg. Can y'all see that? There's three nails that make up a cross. After Jesus died, a man named Joseph asked if he could bury him. This was a brave and loving thing for Jesus to do. Remember that the men who killed Jesus did not believe that he was the son of God, but Jesus did believe, and he wanted Joseph to have a proper burial. Joseph knew that this might get him in trouble with the soldiers, but he was brave and asked for permission anyways. Joseph wrapped the body of Jesus in a cloth and buried him in a tomb cut out of rock like a shallow cave. Jesus went away sad because Jesus was dead and he wondered what would happen next. In the light blue egg, we see a piece of linen cloth, just like Joseph had used with Jesus. The next day, two women came to the tomb of Jesus and they were surprised. The heavy stone had been rolled aside and the tomb was empty. Jesus' body was not there. The angel told them he has risen. Jesus had come back to life. This was the promise that Jesus made to his disciples at their special dinner just a few days before. That he would die, but he would come back to life to show those who believe in him that they would live forever too. Someday, because he died for us, we can meet him and thank him in heaven. And that is the story of Easter, and it is all true. So our last egg we have is the white egg. Now, based on what we've talked about before and what I just read to you, what do y'all think is in the white egg? It's empty, just like the tomb as a reminder that Jesus has risen for us. Dear God, thank you for sending your son to save all of us. Thank you for letting us together and pray together when we cannot be together in person on this very special Easter Sunday. We love you, and we can't wait to see each other again. Amen. 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 Bye, everyone. Thank you guys so much for doing this. So My name is Marianne Leventree, your financial administrator. When this pandemic hit, the uncertainty that you felt, the church staff felt also. Would we be able to remain in ministry? Would we still have jobs? As a church, you responded generously. Each day, I am overwhelmed and humbled by the ways you have stepped up. I believe, despite the challenges, we will become stronger through when all this ends. I am standing in the sacred place, the chapel of St. James. Although we cannot break bread together right now, we are still in communion and we are still in ministry. So whether you give by mail, online, or automatic deduction, your generosity helps St. James to bless our community. Thank you.
Like many of the other Sunday school classes and groups, confirmation class is still meeting, though we no longer gather together at church. Each of the members of the confirmation class has been busy at work memorizing the books of the Bible, the Lord's Prayer, Scripture, and the Apostles' Creed. So today, Alice Rose will lead us all as we affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, was suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Feet, 
fair flowers of paradise extend their fragrance ever sweet. Crown him the Lord of love, behold his hands and side, those wounds yet visible above in beauty glorified. A hail, Redeemer, hail, for thou hast died for me. Our gospel lesson today is from John's gospel, the 20th chapter, verses 1 through 18. We'll start with the first two verses. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Our Easter story begins in the Gospel of John with darkness. It is extremely early in the morning. In fact, it says the sun hasn't even come up, and Mary is on her way to the tomb. It is her job to care for Jesus. She's caring for the body, and as she approaches the tomb in the dark, she realizes that the stone has already been rolled away. She immediately turns around and runs back to the disciples. When she gets to the disciples, she says that Jesus is missing and that she does not know where they have laid him. The disciples immediately get up and they start to run toward the tomb. I think it's wonderful that our Easter story starts in the dark, and starts with an unknown or a mystery. It starts with something that is a question for Mary and in the disciples is where now is Jesus? Where is Jesus? Oftentimes our lives are full of unknowns and sometimes when we encounter those unknowns, it incites fear in us. But Easter is for us Christians everything but fear. But sometimes maybe we should sit in the unknown and in the mystery of the resurrection, and the mystery of where Jesus is in the world. Perhaps we begin, to, we begin our Easter journey with asking that question, where is Jesus? Where is Jesus now in these times? Where is Jesus when we are sharing with one another on Facebook or sharing in virtual meetings? We might wanna ask the question of where is Jesus? That's where our resurrection story begins. It begins with an unknown, with a mystery, and the question of where is Jesus? And instead of that question inciting fear, instead of the unknowns inciting fear in us, perhaps they can move us to a closer relationship with Jesus, a closer relationship with one another as we begin to see Jesus in different places. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. The scene quickly switches 
from the mystery of where have they laid Jesus's body to an investigation. Mary had gone to the edge of the tomb. She had seen that the stone had been rolled away, and then she had run and, and made her inquiry. Well, as the disciple that Jesus loved and Peter get to the scene, they, uh, they are a little more bold, and they go into the tomb, and they, they investigate. They, they notice the uh, neatly folded linens. They notice that uh, the body is not where it should be, and, uh, and they, they really do an analysis, an investigation of this, of this empty tomb. I wonder if years later, these two disciples didn't, uh, didn't wonder if they had missed something in their investigation. Because it's notable that uh, Mary, who had been restrained, when she entered the tomb, she saw two angels. And as she left the tomb, she saw Jesus himself. It's almost as if their investigation got so focused on an empty tomb that they missed the reason that they, had, uh, they were investigating, the risen Lord. Sometimes we can get so focused on something that we can lose sight of its purpose. It's like a, a team of scientists sent to investigate the Bible and they, uh, they analyze the, the paper and, and can tell you exactly where the trees that were used to make the paper pulp, where they came from and what species they were. And they were able to analyze the, the ink, the sources of the ink and the, and the leather on the outside to analyze and tell you exactly what animal the leather came from and, and where in the world it came from. And they could list out a complete report. And, and such a report would be of almost no value. Because the purpose of our scripture is not the makeup of its physical composition. The purpose, of course, is that contained within that physical composition are words that are the word. My brother and a friend of ours one time engaged in an important rite of passage, the making of a pecan pie from scratch. And so they labored over their work all day long, and, and they were so proud as their pie came out of how beautiful it was, and they, they wanted to capture this moment forever. And so what they did was they took that uh, pie and they held it up. And as you can see, in the holding up of that pie, uh, things did not go as planned, and the pie spilled out. They were so focused on uh, capturing this moment of beauty. They were so focused on, uh, on their beautiful pie that they missed out on the reason for the pie, for eating. Friends, I'm standing today in a space that is normally on Easter Sunday chock full of people. This is a space where uh, we would literally have hundreds of people. Every chair you see behind me would be full and spread out. And I know that many of us are lamenting that we're not here or not in our sanctuary, and rightfully so. But what I'd say to you is remember that this space in many ways is the empty tomb. We don't gather in the Christian Life Ministry Center or in the sanctuary uh, in order to fill it. We gather in those spaces because the tomb was empty. And so in some ways, as we celebrate Easter this year, our call is to remember that the church is the empty tomb and that the Lord is risen. The reason that we celebrate Easter has not been diminished in the least. This year, may we of all years celebrate and remember that we don't worship an empty tomb. We worship the risen Lord. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord 
and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. After the disciples investigate the mystery of Easter, after they look into this missing Jesus, Mary is then left at the empty tomb alone. As she sits or stands there or is in that space all alone, I think the reality of Jesus being gone, of her Lord missing, starts to set in for her. and She begins to weep. As she is weeping, she looks down into the tomb and she sees two angels sitting where Jesus was laying. They ask her, they are focused upon her weeping, and they ask, woman, why are you weeping? She proceeds to tell them, because my Lord is gone, and I do not know where they have laid him. As she continues even to weep, someone comes up behind her, and we, as we read the story, know that it is Jesus, but Mary doesn't know that. She is in her grief, and she mistakes him for a gardener. And he, Jesus, even though she thinks he's a gardener, he is focused on her weeping as well, the same as the angels. And they ask, and Jesus asks the same question. Woman, why are you weeping? And in that, she says the same thing. If you know where he is, please tell me so that I may take him away. She is focused upon her missing Lord. She is grief-stricken. And I often wonder if this little section in the resurrection story focused upon Mary's grief is not a kind of representation of the world's grief without God. As if in some way Mary's tears represent uh, the world or all of creation if God was missing in some way. That there would be a kind of hopelessness. There would be something completely wrong and each time Mary says, I don't know where my Lord is. And it's because she doesn't know that that she weeps. And I imagine for all of creation, if we did not have the Lord, there would be weeping. But in the midst of her weeping, this one who stands behind her, this one who asks her about her crying and her weeping, is the very one that she is looking for. It is the one for all of creation that allows us to have hope. Jesus is the hope for Mary and stands directly behind her. So she, in her loneliness, in her grief, really, she is not alone. And the same for us Christians thousands of years later. Because of the one who stands with us, we are not alone. We are not hopeless. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Mary's yearning to see Jesus is fulfilled when she realizes that the gardener who has come to her is in fact Jesus. Mary, he says, and she recognizes him in that moment and says, Rabuni, teacher. Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved had not found Jesus where they expected him. And so they had gone home and John tells us in the next section of his gospel that not long after Jesus had revealed himself to Mary, he goes to their home and reveals himself to them. 
And then uh, Thomas wasn't there. And so John tells us that not long thereafter, Jesus comes again and reveals himself again so that Thomas too will know that he is risen. We have a word for this work. We call it grace, God's unmerited gift to us. And Jesus' continual coming to us, his continual revelation, his resurrected appearances to us, his invitation to resurrection life is grace upon grace. Grace has been God's way since the beginning, for it was by grace that God created humanity in the image of God. We didn't deserve to be created. God did it out of an abundance of love, grace. And by grace, God made a way for Noah and his family when the world seemed stained with sin, a way for them to rebuild and renew through the ark. It was by grace that God invited Abraham and Isaac and Jacob into a covenant relationship that they would be his people and God would be their God. It was by grace when the Israelites were suffering under slavery to Egypt that God would send Moses and deliver the people from slavery. It was by grace when the Israelites had turned away from God that God would send judges and prophets to invite the people to turn around and worship the Lord their God again, grace upon grace upon grace. And then the height of grace itself, grace embodied. When God, through the Son, chooses to be fully human, to walk among us, to be one of us. And, and when God is betrayed and, and dies, God could have chosen to go away forever, to end this world. But instead, what does God choose to do but to overcome death through the resurrection and to come, to come again? And invite us into resurrection life. Grace upon grace upon grace. That story in the Old Testament where uh, Jacob had betrayed his brother Esau. And he, uh, he had fled the country and, and made his way over where he met his wives, Leah and Rachel. And then they, they were making their way back. And, and he knew Esau was going to be there. And he knew Esau had every reason to be angry with him. And, and as he's making his way, he's making preparations in case Esau wants to kill him and his family. And, and he sees Esau at a distance. And Esau, who had every right to, uh, to turn his back on Jacob, who had every right to, to come at him and hurt him, Esau runs to Jacob. And of all things, Esau gives his brother a hug. That is what Jesus does for us, friends. Jesus comes to us, even when he could have turned away, even when he could have met us with wrath. Jesus comes, grace upon grace upon grace. Jesus doesn't meet Mary where she expects to see him. Jesus doesn't meet Peter and the disciple whom he loved where they expected to see them. Instead, Jesus comes to us. He doesn't sit back and let us discover him. He comes to us by grace and meets us in the most unlikely of places. Perhaps it's not in the sanctuary that he meets us, but instead in the narthex. Perhaps it's, it's in the parking lot that Jesus meets us. Perhaps it's even in our homes on Easter Sunday that Jesus comes to us. But this much is true. Just as Jesus meets Mary in the garden, just as Jesus meets Peter and the disciple whom he loved and the other disciples in the home, Jesus comes to us too because not even death can keep him away from us. The grace and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ cannot be defeated even by death for the Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Amen. Mary and Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved went to the tomb where they expected to find Jesus. But Jesus was not where they expected him to be. Jesus wasn't in the tomb. The tomb was empty. Jesus had risen and he met them in the garden. He met them in their homes. 
The risen Lord meets us today, not in an empty tomb, but in our homes. Hallelujah. May we see the risen Lord, for he is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. We have each other.